So I'm excited to check out these uh, two potential deals. We're going to be looking at a property in Welland in St. Catharines. This property is currently a duplex. So there's a, an investor that had already purchased the property and um, renovated it um, and is looking to part, have a money partner hold the mortgage and also consider um, adding uh, another unit. So oh, okay. sometimes there can be a little bit of give and take there, but okay. I, I would say that if it's actually going to be even under 475 as the refinance, something doesn't feel right to me about this deal. And I would, I would do a lot of due diligence. <laughs>
Yeah, so essentially um, this, the, this property is currently a duplex. So there's a, an investor that had already purchased the property and um, renovated it um, and is looking to part, have a money partner hold the mortgage and also consider um, adding uh, another unit. So either converting into a triplex or creating some sort of a, a coach house. Um, so the purchase price would be $420,000. Uh, I would need to put um, an $84,000 down payment. And the loan that we would be carrying would be $336,000. Okay. And essentially the way the deal is going to work is 50-50 um, split down the middle for everything, right? Yeah, for everything, exactly. And one of the questions I had around this deal and the investor was really helpful in answering all my questions was when does that end so that what that was a big question mark for me and so mm -hmm. I talked to a couple of people and they said well it sometimes it's five years but it's definitely something that's negotiable so that was definitely something that I thought okay I need to really dig into that a little bit further yeah what we often find is a lot of newer investors or a lot of more experienced investors that partner with a lot of new investors they'll often tie the length of the JV, like unless it's a, we're in business for life together, it's often going to be tied to what that a mortgage term is, right? So if you're on like a, a three or a five year term, often when it comes up for renewal, that's kind of when people will decide, okay, do we want to continue on this for another three to five years? Or would we like to wrap up at this point? And oh. one, so it's great to hear you talking about the exit strategy because that is really important. I personally don't think anyone should get into a deal until they already know how they're going to get out of the deal. And that doesn't mean that you have to exactly follow that plan, but getting into a property without a plan usually does like can still end well, but it's never going to end as well as it could have had we had a plan in the first place. Right. Um, and one, one thing that might be worth researching a little bit, often when we're talking about, uh, JV partnership dissolutions, a very common approach is what's called the shotgun clause. And that's essentially just a very, it, it can sometimes sound like a little intimidating, but it's actually a, a very simple process where essentially, let's say we're JV partners on this property and we're deciding it's not really working out well. Well, at that point in time, either one of us can make an offer to the other person. And at that point in time, the mm -hmm. other partner, the one that didn't make the offer has, has a choice of saying yes or no. And so, for example, let's say I decided I want to buy you out, Julie, and I was like, I'll pay you $100,000 for your share. At that point in time, you've got the choice of either saying yes and accepting my $100,000 or saying no, and then you buy my share for $100,000. And the idea there, very similar, like when you're dealing with kids and you're going to try and split a candy bar, one cuts it, the other chooses sides. That's mm -hmm. legitimately essentially what we're doing when we're talking about like a shotgun clause for a oh. JV partnership. Okay. That's really interesting because I mean, there, there could be different life events. So that, that flexibility is really important for us. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So then just kind of walking through the property. So the JV, the partner you're looking at JV and they already own this property. They so own it, but um, with a, I guess with a private money loan, I'm not sure if I'm using the right yep. term. Private financing. Yeah. 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 So okay. I guess and to avoid capital gains they this, this is what how it was explained to me they would want to sell as a uh, to the home to a partner a money partner rather than um doing a i guess a transfer of sale um so this is why i would be purchasing the property from them but we're still in the jv gotcha and then as far as the purchase price the four hundred and twenty thousand. How was that amount determined? Is that the price they bought it for? Have they got an appraisal done? They are going to get an appraisal. This is their comp uh, price. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And so did they provide you some like uh, examples of just kind of how they came up with the 420 or is that? No, I, and I didn't ask for them. So I'm guessing that's a good thing to do to ask. Yeah, them. I personally would. Um, again, like if this was in my backyard of London, Ontario, I'm usually confident enough that I just know the market. But if I was getting into a new market, I really would. And there's a couple different ways you could frame that question. And depending upon how you frame it, it's likely how they're going to receive it. So you could be like, I don't believe you. I want to see comps. Or it could just be like, <laughs> hey, I'm trying to learn 
in this process, I would love just to understand the mental math you went through to get to the 420. So if you could provide me the comps and stuff, I would love just to be able to do my own study of it because I'm trying to learn everything about this process. And I think if you take the latter approach rather than the former, yeah, then, yeah, I don't buy it. <laughs> yeah, then I don't think people will have any issues with that. Um, I'm getting a pen because you're giving me a lot of good tips here. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> no problem. I got my notepad now. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So yeah, then otherwise, just kind of as we're walking through the property, down payment, closing costs, all that looks pretty standard. So repairs, we're looking at a, a good chunk, but it's because we're going to be potentially adding another unit or adding a coach house. Um, Obviously, yeah. one thing that immediately comes to mind and coach houses are pretty new. So it's going to be rare that the answer is yes. But I would love to find out, you know, have they done a coach house before or have they essentially are they in the process of doing a coach house already? And things like that would certainly add more confidence um, to my desire to get into business with them specifically, because, again, that can be a huge value add. If they're the coach house person for St. Okay. Catharines, they understand how to navigate that city. Um or sorry, this is in Welland, but uh, if they understand how to navigate that city, that can be a real value add to the partnership where, um, again, that can really change my my internal mental math when thinking of whether I want to say yes or no, because if they're that person, you know, I can either go through this process with them once and try and become an expert myself by just learning through them, or I can just have a set it and forget it JV partner that I can rinse and repeat with if they're really good at doing this as well. Okay. Good point. Very um, good. So then and we've comps, um, I mean, sorry, comps, yep. comps, closing costs. I had a really hard time trying to figure out, like I just went on different websites and kind of figured it out. But um, is there a sort of a benchmark that you recommend for? Sure. Um, and shameless plug at cashflowtribe.com. We've got a free uh, um, closing cost calculator that you can check out. But high level, the big cost you're going to have to take into consideration is land transfer tax. And then the second biggest cost is going to be legal fees. Um, now, legal fees are usually pretty standard. Um, I would expect somewhere between fourteen and probably seventeen hundred for the legal fees, and that'll include things like title insurance and all the miscellaneous disbursements. Um, and then on the land transfer tax, you can literally just plug that in, whether it's on the CashflowTribe.com calculator or you know, there's a bunch of other online free calculators. Just make sure you pick the right region. In this case, it's just going to be Ontario. Um, because Welland won't have a city specific uh, land transfer tax. Oh, okay. Good to and know. Then that'll be the bulk of it. Then beyond that, there's just going to be small little things. Um, so in general, when I used to like be buying smaller, like single family properties or duplexes and triplexes, we'd often have like, we budget for our land transfer tax, we would budget for our legal fees. And then we would just budget $2,500 as a reserve fund. And that would be for any miscellaneous disbursement. So sometimes what you might find, and this will vary, but let's say that, you know, the day before closing, they paid property taxes. Mm -hmm. And then, so, well, now we need to do an adjustment because, you know, we got to prorate everything to make sure it's equal. So oftentimes there's a little bit of this or that coming and going um, in regards to that. But otherwise, again, at first blush, the $7,000 for closing costs sounds about right to me. Okay. Okay. And then and yep. this was the, the high level estimate of what the coach house would cost or the, or the triplex conversion. It was a range, but I just kind of. Yeah. And so it. certainly this is a good start before I ever a hundred percent committed to a deal like this, I would really want a detailed itemized budget. And again, I would love it if they've done it before, or if they haven't done it before, even if they're just going through it, if they're like two steps ahead with a different JV partner, even that little bit of insight can be very helpful just to, uh, give me perspective. So if right. they are doing this with a current JV partner, or if they've done it in the past, Julie, I would try and get a reference, right. And be able to just chat with that person and find out how it goes. Now, as far as $75,000, I've never done a coach house before. Um, but, you know, it's hard for me to think it's going to be a lot less than that um, to do it. So that's, we're really just making sure that they're being realistic with their cost estimates. And then another, just like, asterisks here or thing to take into consideration is if they're really wrong about it is there any sort of um check and balance or penalty there right so like if it turns out to be one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, is that just a whoops everyone makes mistakes or is it like okay <laughs> no like because we doubled our budget you actually now only have 25 percent of the deal or you won't like you know where maybe oh, the okay. 
the structure changes a bit. Um, yes. And again, everything's negotiable, but we also have to understand their perspective, right? So, yeah. you know, there's a give and take here. Right now, I'm really focused on protecting Julie, but at the same time, if they've got 80 other investors that are about to rubber stamp this, it's important you understand that and you do your own risk reward calculation and figure out what's the big things that I have to have certainty on and what are the things that would just be nice to have. Okay. Okay. And is it appropriate to ask for, I really like the idea of just, it, it, it could be part of the, the discussion, the negotiation, but is it, is it um, appropriate to ask for, you know, examples of other um, coach houses that were done? Like, have you yeah. done other things? Can you share, can I talk to your. Yeah, absolutely. Other, and if, partner? if they immediately don't like that, again, I'm not saying that that's like the worst red flag of all time, but it's not a flag I like. So if they're like, okay. nope, I don't got any JV partners you can talk to. Again, like if they're like, hey, you know what? I've never actually done a carriage house before, but we have done duplex to triplex conversions and I've got a couple JV partners you can talk to. You know, like that's someone that's focused on solving my problem where if they're like, nope, next question. Yeah. I'm like, okay, well, I kind of see how this is. This is like a, this is, you know, Henry Ford making me a car. I can have any yeah. color as long as it's black, right? Yeah. Like, um, so again, okay. just and like, because you're new to this, odds are you're probably going to want an environment or an ecosystem where you're allowed to ask more questions than less, right? So yeah. again, if you don't feel comfortable with this JV partner asking questions, and that's part of the reason you want to get into it. Again, that's probably a dynamic that I personally wouldn't want to get into. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then same with if they've never done a carriage house before or a coach house before, I might ask, oh, has your contractor done one? Right. Because again, like, okay. or like, do you have an example of just one you've driven by or just anything? Right. Because has anyone ever done this before in Welland? Right. Because also the other thing is yeah. Welland is a smaller community. Right. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, odds are like, it's been my anecdotal experience when dealing with smaller communities, they're either very for you or against you. So like, you know, it, it usually isn't too hard to get an idea of which way the wind's blowing, the smaller the municipality or the city hall, the easier it is to know. Um, so again, if they're regularly doing deals here, they should be able to tell you like, oh, hey, I've never done a coach house before, but I know two other investors, they've done multiple times, the city green lights it, we're going to use the same architect, you know, all those things are like, okay, awesome. Like these are huge value adds where if they're like, no, I have no idea how to do this, but I'll figure it out. That's not terrible, but I maybe not paying much for their level of expertise, then it really comes down to the deal itself rather than any expertise or bonuses that they're bringing to the table. True. Okay. Okay. That's really good advice. Okay. Great. All right. Um, yep. So one of the things that I was struggling with is understanding if I should be in my analysis, if I should be putting the cost of interest. So for my down payment and for the, coach house, like the, or the triplex, I would be taking uh, money from my HELOC and there's an interest cost to that. So I guess as a, as a JV managing partner, you might not work that into the deal, but I mean, for me, there's a cost. So yep. what's, what's your advice on that? Yeah. Um, I don't think that there's a, like there's a gold standard here that every investor does. I've seen a lot of investors approach it different ways. The one thing I will say is for a lot of investors that are focused on doing multiple deals and having a really scalable solution, they usually want to throw in all the costs and sometimes even a little bit extra to make sure that this can be done again and again and again and again. Because, you know, for any investor looking to build a like scale a portfolio, having a one-time magic trick isn't very useful, right? So like if we can pull this off once, but it's never gonna work again, that's not very valuable to me. So if the only reason I can do a deal is because I came into a million dollar inheritance, but after that deal, I'm gonna be tapped out and not be able to do any more deals. Well, then that's kind of like a one-time magic trick. So mm -hmm. in this case, if this is the business model that you're like, hey, if this works, we wanna do it again and again and again. And maybe eventually I want to be the managing partner and I want to be able to sell someone like me on this, well, again, obviously it's going to be easier to sell a potential money partner if all their costs are factored in, even if they don't get like, even if the partnership's not reimbursing you for the cost, it's still important you just understand like, hey, as an overall rate of return, where do I land? So right. I think the way a lot of investors would do it is they would first calculate everything without that cost of the down payment funds. Um, but they usually would include the cost of 
like carrying the renovation funds because that that carrying cost is usually standard. But mm -hmm. then, like for my own internal reporting, I would probably then factor in what my uh, uh, home equity line of credit cost is going to be on the down payment portion as well, and just kind of look at everything, you know, in two chunks, right? Like what what does it look like on the surface and then behind the scene for Julie specifically in your exact life situation, what does it look like? Okay. Okay. That's good. Cause originally, like I was trying to get to the numbers that were um, given to me. I was, so I was trying mm -hmm. to replicate that in my own um, calculation and um, I wasn't getting there. And I realized it's cause I had the HELOC interest costs. So, and that's where we, but, but that's valuable to me because if I'm paying back that interest, every month, the, my cash flow is not going to be, you know, what, yeah. it, what I, what I would, I guess what it's advertised to be, which is okay, but it, uh, that's what I was struggling with. Do I put it in or not? Because I mean, yeah. I and so the interest. reason that the JV investor wouldn't have put it in is because everyone's cost of capital is different, right? So very okay. similar to the reason why we have things like cap rates in the first place, a cap mm -hmm. rate is just a calculation that ignores your cost of borrowing. And the reason for that is, is because like Matt McKeever can borrow at a different interest rate than Julie, than Adam, than Steve, and so on and so forth. And so it's one, almost impossible to know where a person's cost of funds is. But two, we want to be able to quickly be able to compare uh, apples to apples opportunities, right? And just ignoring yeah. debt costs is the fastest way. So that makes sense. So, I, so then your tip is do that surface calculation, but then do the one in the background for myself. Yeah. To make sure it fits your lifestyle. Right. Because again, right. you mentioned on this call that you're probably not going to quit your job immediately or anything, but if you were, that's really important. Right. Because like, yeah. if you think that you're making a bunch of money, but then once all the dust settles, you're not, even if you're making a lot in net worth, like even if appreciation's really bailing you out, if you can't tap into it and you quit your day job, you're going to find yourself really cash crunched. And that's when a lot of investors get themselves in a bad position. But even, okay. even in your situation where you don't plan to quit, I think it's still really valuable to know where things sit. Okay, great. So, I mean, this, the, the rest is typical. It's like the mortgage payment, yep. property taxes, total payment. And so the cash flow before uh, refinancing is $26. So that's, you know, that's, obviously nominal. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we refinance, so this number here was just my guess. So how do you, so I guess I would ask the same question to yes. the managing partners. Yeah. Where do you think we'll land? Yeah. And they should be able to provide that for you. And if they can't, that again, not the absolute end of the world, but that's a bigger red flag for me because if they haven't thought through the exit on this business model, again, it shows a lack of attention to detail. Now, sometimes what happens like um, is sometimes a, a potential partner, like a, someone looking for money partner, they might spray it out to everyone and not put a lot of thought into the initial proposal. But then once someone shows interest, so they might be like, oh, I think it's about 500, but I actually need to get my realtor to pull and finalize it. If you're actually interested in moving forward, Julie, that to me wouldn't be like the same sort of red flag as like, oh yeah, I'm not sure what's going to reappraise. Yeah. Like that would be like, okay, <laughs> this is not good. The one thing I will say though, is I hope it appraises a lot higher than that if you guys build that carriage house. The reason I'm saying that is if the property is already worth 420 and I'm about to spend 75,000, me personally, that property has to be worth 500,000 or more because again, we're taking on a slight risk here because your all in cost is going to be 495,000. So really 500,000 means you've only made $5,000 in appreciation um, right. by doing all this work. So if we do all this work, there's also the risk that things could go wrong and we could go over budget or mm -hmm. it could be delayed or COVID craziness or whatever, right? So it, in general, and again, this is very personal based upon what your goals are, mm -hmm. but I would say it wouldn't be uncommon based upon what I understand about this situation and what I understand about Welland for an investor, they'd probably want to be closer to 550 for this to make sense. Now, the only reason they might not do that is if this was going to be a massive cash cap. So sometimes people will compromise. They'll be like, okay, I know I'm not going to make all my money on the front end through appreciation, but I'll make it on the back end with a lot of cash flow. Oh, so okay. sometimes there can be a little bit give and take there, but okay. I, I would say that if it's actually going to be even under 475 as the refinance, something doesn't feel right to me about this deal. And I would... I would do a lot of due diligence before committing to it. If yeah. 
if he's got if the JV partners got comparables and they're somewhere in the fives, on the surface at least, this feels a lot more right, assuming we trust that seventy-five thousand dollar renovation budget. Okay, and they may, but this is again my inexperience with these is that I didn't ask for that number yet. But that's a great tip. So I'm I guess what I'm hearing from you is look at it like a flip too, right? Like yep. if I'm going to put in seventy-five, yep. it should be absolutely. So like. This is a burr is a flip to yourself, right? right? And so sometimes we might compromise a bit on the profits we make on a flip to ourselves, especially mm -hmm. if it's going cash flow well or this, that, like there can be a lot of different factors that an investor may be taking in consideration when looking at the chessboard. But certainly um, in general, we still want it to be net profitable because what happens if things go sideways and you can't rent it out? Well, now you have to sell it. If you have to sell it for 455 right after you renovated it, that's going to really hurt because also you got to pay your realtor, right? So like by the time all your disbursements and stuff, we're probably only going to get like four hundred, four hundred and twenty thousand dollars, which means yeah, getting home, right? Yeah. So <laughs> getting home. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we definitely just want to make sure we cross our T's and dot our I's on these numbers, but they should be able to have the data to provide us, or if they don't, they should be confident to go get it and bring it back to us. Okay. Because again, okay. if if you were talking to me about a deal like this in London. I might just throw numbers based upon my market knowledge. And then when you got serious, I'd be like, okay, let me go get a realtor. We'll pull the data and, you know, I'll prove that I'm in the right range. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So thanks for that. And then the, the other help, I guess the other concern I had was around the money left in the deal. I think that's the way we say it. Yeah. It's said. So um, if you look down here, the original cash into the deal. So that's basically the down payment and the renovation costs. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is the cash back after the refi. Yeah. Which is, right. And so this is going to vary dramatically based upon that appraised value. Right. So I wouldn't get too hung up because I think like, I'm glad you used a very conservative number, but I think you probably used far too conservative of a number. So once we get more accurate data, I think these numbers are going to look way different. So I don't even think it necessarily spends a lot of time to uh, focus on this at this stage, Julie, but I also just realized it's uh, coming up on 3.30 and I got to jump off for my next deal destruction, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> but I really appreciate you uh, booking an episode for this deal destruction. I want to wish you the best of luck on this deal or the next deal. And regardless, uh, down the road, if you're looking at other deals, feel free to book a deal destruction. And if anyone is interested in follow along with you on your journey, will you be sharing it on social media? I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Haven't okay. decided yet. Okay. Do you want to share your social media handle or not yet? Uh, not yet. Okay. No problem. All right. Well, again, really appreciate you coming prepared with this uh, really well thought out Excel sheet, Julie, and best of luck on the potential deals. Thank you for your help. Appreciate okay. it. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>